1 Corinthians chapter number 13 is where I want you to be in your Bibles. We're talking about the issue of manuscript evidence. We're picking up in our Grace School of the Bible series. We're calling it, <laughs> we're really giving it two names. We're calling it Grace School of the Bible. We're calling it Great Lakes Grace uh, School. And the reason why we're doing that is because it's, I, I've told you over and over again, and I just, for the sake of clarity, um, it's heavily based upon Grace School of the Bible. So I want to give credit where credit is due, and a lot of this is the notes that I've had from, uh, from taking it through Richard Jordan and the training course that he had, but I also am doing, putting my own things into it, and I don't want you to think that, or I don't want you to hold Richard accountable for the things that, that I do, you know, for the, so, or to, to make people think that it's exclusively that, or uh, to have a problem with it and attribute it to him. So uh, it's a bit of both. But we're talking about the issue of manuscript evidence and why that's important. You recall all of the, where, where we've come from. We've talked about revelation, inspiration, illumination, and preservation. And we've, we've dealt so far with the issue of revelation. We've dealt with inspiration. You recall we've gone through a lot of verses to talk about what inspiration is. And we talked about what illumination is. <clears throat> um, but we haven't yet gotten to the issue of preservation. And so we're, the, the, just to, to reset the stage is that the issue of revelation is that God has communicated something from him to you that you can know. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of people, when they talk about their view of the Bible, they leave it there that God has only communicated something, and they don't believe that that has been preserved to them perfectly to today. But they'll make a comment about, I believe that the Bible is uh, in, inspired and inerrant in the original autographs, right, which no one has. So what good does it have you, what good does it do you to have an inspired Bible in the original autographs that no one has today, nor has anyone ever had at a particular time in the past? Because there's been no church ever that has collated the original autographs. Do you understand that? Paul wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. He wrote a letter to the church at Galatia. And what did they do after they received those letters? They made copies of them. And no person ever has had an original autograph Bible. So when someone comes along and tells you, I believe in the word of God is perfectly inspired in the original autographs, what they're telling you is, I don't believe that there is such a thing as the word of God. Because there is no such thing as an original autograph word of God. And this is where the skepticism creeps in from the believers, where they come in and they question, well, that's a, they should have, uh, you know, that should have been translated this way, that should have been done this way, or that the original word here should be such and such. Oh, really? How do you know? So we need to get to the issue of preservation, but we're talking about the completion and the completeness of your Bible. And we dealt with three reasons. I gave you a handout, right? And one of the one of the topics there was three reasons why uh, you know that your Bible is complete. And one of the issues that we're dealing with is that the Old Testament canon was fixed at the time of Christ. And the Old Testament canon that was fixed at the time of Christ was identified by Christ. It was identified by Christ. And so it was fixed and it was identified so we know what the, the Old Testament canon is. The second thing that we're talking about and reasons why you know your Bible exists is because the revelation has ceased. And the third reason that you know that the Bible is complete is we'll talk about the doctrine of preservation. The doctrine of preservation. Now, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 through 14, Paul is dealing with the issue of prophecy and tongues. And this is where we left off in our last class, right? Because we were talking about revelation that God gives, and God has get, gave the gift of prophecy and tongues because before you had a completed Bible, how would you know the Word of God? If you needed to know what it was that, that how it is that you're saved today, you, where would you turn to in your Bible? If you want to know the gospel by which you're saved today, where would you turn? Well, well, if you had this, you can turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 and see how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again. And you could go over to Romans and see how that Christ 
died for our sins and how that man is justified uh, by grace alone and Christ's imputed righteousness coming to your account. How is a man going to be right with God? Because Christ imputes his righteousness to you. You could go to Romans. You could go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and learn that, by, uh, that a person is saved by grace through faith and that not of works lest any man should boast. But now let me ask you a question. If you didn't have Romans, and if you didn't have Ephesians, and if you didn't have Corinthians, how would you know the gospel of the grace of God? Put yourself in the early church where Paul is going out and preaching, but you're in a household and you don't have the word of God. God gave the gift of prophecy and tongues for people to be able to supernaturally be able to give the, the word of God to people. Right? A prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. Right? And they're speaking the things of God because in the assembly people would need to know the word of God. So if we were here tonight and we didn't have Paul's epistles and we didn't have this because you know, we're starting to meet uh, in the early church right after Paul was commissioned and we come together, how are we going to know the things of God? God gave, special, God gave gifts to men. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Prophecy in tongues is the issue of being the mouthpiece of God. Tongues is not some jibber-jabber today to show you that you're spiritually elite compared to other Christians because you know some secret language, right? It reminds me of like watching, what is that uh, Red Rider movie? You know, it goes on at Christmas time, you know. I've got the secret decoder from my cereal box. And if you send in, you'll know how to decode the message. You know, drink your Ovaltine. Uh, but the issue here is that the, the people speaking in tongues is not that you've got some secret decoder. The mouthpiece uh, for the people of God in time past was being able to proclaim the word of God in the language to the people who were sitting there listening. Right? Because if we went into a, if we went into a French church to be able to speak and I didn't know French, how am I going to communicate the word of God to a congregation who only speak French? So God gave the gift of tongues so that the prophets who were speaking the word of God could speak in people's language for the purpose of them being edified. All right. So the gift of tongues, what Paul is going on here, and the, the, the ultimate point of what we're trying to get to here is we're explaining how that, those, why those gifts were given in, in relation to Revelation and now why they have ceased. Because now if we have something that is now perfect, and that which is perfect is come, meaning God has given you all the revelation he would have you to have, and it's been written down for you to be able to read, is there a need any longer for a person to receive a special revelation from God in order to be able to preach? I will tell you that it would be much easier for me if I never picked up that book and I just came in here on Sundays and say, okay, God, have at it and just speak through me. And he just, you know, spoke through me and gave me a revelation to be able to preach to you. But that's not what God does. Because God told Timothy, he said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so now God has given you the revelation and what does he expect us to do? He expects us to read his word, to hear from him. Not to sit in a dark corner and wait for him to speak supernaturally to you because that's not how he communicates today. Now, there's nothing wrong with going over in a dark corner and meditating upon his truth. But don't go over in a dark corner expecting to receive some new revelation from God that isn't already given to you in this book because that's not going to, that's not going to be what happens. All right, so the same process of this, the, the prophecy in tongues, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenon that goes on. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 8. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 8. I'm getting there myself. <clears throat> Paul says, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be, there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So there are three gifts given there in that verse. What are they? Prophecy, tongues, and the gift of knowledge. And Paul is saying there that there's, there's going to come a time 
when as the mouthpiece of God, having this knowledge and being given the gift of prophecy, that these gifts that God has been using to make his word known, that eventually these are going to be ceased and they're not going to be used anymore, right? He says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Does that mean that there's going to be no knowledge on the basis of the earth? <laughs> no man has any knowledge. No, that's not what God is saying. Is he going to say that no man can speak any language? Well, that's not true because I'm standing up here talking. So has tongues gone away? No. The issue is, is that as it relates to there being a gift, of prophecy, a gift of tongues, a gift of knowledge, those will go away because God will give you that which is complete and everything that you need. So when does that time come, right? When does that time come that they go away? Look at verse number nine. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. I, I, I want you to pick up there that there's a partial knowledge and there's a partial prophecy. Why is that? <clears throat> well, when God gave people a gift to be able to speak back then when the word of God was not complete and he had someone speak, he, had, he gave them a word. But they didn't read the full word, did they? <laughs> it's not like they got up every morning and quoted Romans chapter 1 through the book of Philemon. And there, we've given you the full knowledge. We've given you the full revelation committed unto Paul. No. There, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I have partial, I don't have the word of God because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a church at the time of Christ and I don't have all the letters that Paul has written, so I can't study Ephesians, and I can't study Galatians, and I can't study Corinthians. Hopefully I've got Romans. <laughs> but I, I don't have all this knowledge. So God supernaturally gave people the gift of knowledge to be able to communicate to the church for their edification. Okay? But he's saying when that which is, in, uh, when that which is um, perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. That's why we call this the perfect and complete Word of God. Because it is perfect and it takes care of all the needs of knowledge. Okay? So the, the partial will be done away with. That's partial knowledge and partial prophecy. That will be done away with. It, you notice it doesn't say partial knowledge because, because there's the, um, I, I mean, there's the partial knowledge and the partial prophecy. What will come that will do away with the partial knowledge? Perfect knowledge. Perfect knowledge. Which is full understanding. When that which is perfect is come. That's the completion of revelation. We're talking about the issue of revelation and, and preservation. This is the issue of revelation. That is why Paul says in, First uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, that the word of God is given to him to fulfill, to complete the, the word of God. Look over at Colossians. Hold your hands there in, in Corinthians and look at, look at Colossians real quick. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25. There it is. I'm looking for the end of verse 25 where it says, Where have I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God? So Paul says, I was given this revelation, the dispensation of the grace of God, in order to fulfill the word of God. And when it's fulfilled, then it comes into perfection. And so at that point in time, there was a gift, I know you probably can't see it because the text is so small, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. <clears throat> it's basically saying at that, point in uh, 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 at that point in time that the gifts were given, prophecy, tongues, knowledge, but then in verse 8 what Paul says, then the gifts are going to be done away with. That there's a partial knowledge and a partial pro prophecy in part that happened now at that point in time, and then what's going to happen in the future is the completion of revelation. 
Let's, let's continue looking. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. You still got your finger there? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I came, he, what he's saying there is when I became a man, when I came to maturity, when I came to perfection, I put away childish things. So the childish, the, the childish things is, is, the, is, is the gifts that are given because you don't have the full maturity yet. And so there had to be gifts given in order for people to understand. Look at uh, verse number 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. So Paul is talking now at, at that point in time, right? Like, not now today. But he says, now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. So there's coming a time when the, when the word of God is, is going to be complete. And the, 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 the issue of the things that we're talking about, the gifts, are, they're not going to be needed anymore. We have everything we need today in the book. You've got a complete written, written record of everything that God would have you to have. We've spent the time going through and looking about what the Bible writer, writers said about the, the book and what they said about themselves and how we identified what was Scripture and what, was not, was, what not was Scripture. So there, there wasn't a written body of revelation at that point. There's not a need for a man today to communicate to you any special revelation from God. If a man gets up on a stage and says, I've gotten a, I have a special revelation from you, for you, from God, what, he, what that person is saying is that the word of God is not complete, right? And it's not perfect, and it's not been fulfilled, because I've got something new to communicate to you, something that you would be lacking if I didn't tell you. But what I'm telling you is that you're complete in Christ and lacking nothing, You've been given all knowledge to be able to understand these things. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? You see, these are the things that were given to the church. Everyone has a psalm. Everyone has a doctrine. Everyone has a tongue. Everyone has a revelation. We don't have that in our church. Is that because we're not biblical? Are we an unbiblical church because someone doesn't get up on Sunday mornings and speak in a different tongue and in a different language to communicate to people? No. You see, the reason that was given was because of the, the way that the churches were integrated at that time and the different languages that were spoken. You know, we're in a place where everybody speaks English. We don't need to speak in a different tongue. Well, I speak hillbilly, but you guys can still understand me enough, right? It's part English. It's, it's not based in English, but it, it, it relates enough to where you can understand. But you get the point is that we don't need to do those things. And a person no longer gets a special doctrine from God to be able to communicate to the congregation because the doctrine has been included in his word. And now it's up to us as a congregation to, live the, to, to learn this and to live it out. And to be able to take that doctrine and come in with an understanding already. You see, you have access to something that the early church never had access to. You have the privilege of holding the word of God in your hand 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, with access to it any time you wanted to. And you can come together with that edification. And you see, when they came together, none of them had access to the word of God. And when they gathered together, they were looking for that revelation from God. You see, we're a blessed people, and yet we probably use it less than any people in, in history, right? I'm raising my own hand. Uh, this is not me, you know, looking down on you. Shame on you all. No, no, this is, this, is, this is all around the table, right? We take it for granted. The reason that the charismatic movement, uh, this is a point I really want you to get, when I say charismatic movement, I want you to understand that there's a group they call, they go by the name of charismatics or Pentecostals. 
They're the people who think that the church you know, began on the day of Pentecost, and they think that the gift of the, the tongues that was given there at Pentecost is, is part and parcel of, of the primary thing of what's going on in the churches today, is that you come together and you speak in tongues because this is the language of God and Holy Spirit language. But you need to, I, I hope you understand from just what we've covered so far in the, in the 13 weeks that we've been together, how that, that is incorrect according to Scripture on what Scripture says about itself and what we'll continue to study. But the point is this. And the reason why the charismatic movement is so dangerous is that what its doctrine teaches is continuing inspiration. Now, I don't know. Maybe that went over your head. Continuing inspiration and revelation, right? But they think that they're inspired of God to be able to speak revelation, right? Because we talked about the Bible writers received a revelation and were inspired of God to write things down or as prophets spoke. And what I'm telling you the dangerous thing is, is, is in that movement is for people to get up because what they are, the, the, the essence of their doctrine is that God is still giving the, that, that inspiration has not ended, it's not ceased, that it's still going on. In which case, this is only a footnote to God's revelation, right? And that if a preacher gets up and tells you something different, tells you something, I got a revelation from God, you need to sell your houses and your land and bring all your money here and give it to the church. <laughs> well, preacher, I don't think that that's really what God had to tell you. No, I'm sure. That's exactly what he said to me, you know. I, I, you know, I joke about money because that happens, right? People on TV say, send in your money and you'll be blessed a thousand times over. That's a lie. God never promised no such thing. But when they get up and they speak, and they think that they have the words of God in their mouth, if what they're saying is true, we should be writing all of that down, right? If, if what they're saying, uh, listen to me, uh, understand my very basic point. If what they're saying is coming from God, just like the revelation that Paul received and wrote down, if what they're saying is coming from God, you should write down what they're saying and keep adding it into the back of your book every Sunday when they speak. When they say that they're speaking in tongues and they've gotten a word from God and that this is inspired of Him. I hope you understand the danger with that. One of the dangers with that is that the written word of God would not be your final authority. You see, when you come into this church, <laughs> no man is your final authority. I'm not your final authority. Carl's not your final authority. No man. The book is your final authority. And you have a litmus test whereby to say, if that man is up there in the pulpit lying, we're going to remove him. And the purpose of the pulpit ministry in a church is for a man to study the word of God and to be able to teach it faithfully to others for you to be edified but we should be able to point to the book. And whatever I teach should come from here. Not, I have a revelation from God. Let me tell you something. Like, if you don't think that that happens, <laughs> it happens. Turn, turn on TBN. Don't turn on TBN. <laughs> but if you did, if you turned on your TV, most of the Christian programming that's on TV is by the charismatic movement. And it makes a mockery of Christ. <laughs> and it undermines, it undermines the absolute and final authority of that book. Now let me tell you why I'm not surprised by this. Why is it so popular? I think it's so popular because Satan is very, very effective. Satan is very effective. Satan's object, Satan's object ever since the beginning has been to get people to go against the Word of God, to destroy 
the final authority of the word of God. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Satan shows up on the scene, and what is the very first thing that Satan says? Yea, hath God said? Not yea, hath God said that? <laughs> He's not a cheerleader. It's a critical statement. It is a questioning yea. It is a yea? Has, has God really said that? And any way that he can get people to undermine the authority of the book, he'll do. And my point to you is that when you go to the Christian bookstore and you have, maybe if you're lucky, you might have a couple of authorized King James versions on the shelf. You, for every one of these books, there'll be a hundred in, in a different translation. Why do you think that is? I'm telling you it's because Satan is effective at what he does. And he gets everybody to think, well, well, it's all the Word of God. Just people have different preferences. Look, it's coming from a corrupt source, and it's a corrupt translation. This book is the only book that is translated from the source from which it came. And I believe it to be pure and living water. All right, so I, I, want, I would hope that you would come to the point that when we're done studying preservation... We haven't gotten there yet. You know how we spend a lot of time? We spent like two weeks just going verse after verse on inspiration. And now I've come back out to take a big picture look at where we came from and going into preservation. But we're going to go into preservation. We're going to spend like another two weeks just going verse after verse after verse on the issue of preservation. <clears throat> but what I want you to come away with is the issue that revelation is complete. And therefore, inspiration is complete. So you've got that little graph, I think, at the bottom of your chart there, where I've got what things relate with which. And I think that you've got there, wait, I think I have a slide on it here. So you have this little chart there that says, revelation produces inspiration. God has, has finished his revelation to man. He's given it to you. Now it's up to you to believe it. And because revelation has ceased... Therefore, inspiration has ceased. What has not ceased is the preservation of the words that God has inspired. Now, th this issue of the doctrine of preservation. <clears throat> the doctrine of preservation, um, I've, I wrote a note up here that it gives you a biblical basis for your faith to rest upon. The fact that God has not only written his word down, but that he has pledged to keep it and to preserve it through history so that you might know that you have the word of God. The basis of your faith. <clears throat> I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the field of textual criticism. But it's where men come to the Bible and they try to tell you which parts and pieces of the Bible you can believe. Because they try to go back through history and they say, well, here's a reason why you shouldn't trust this verse. And here's a reason why you shouldn't trust this word. And here's a reason why you shouldn't trust this passage or it shouldn't be here. You see, the reason why, the, the reason why you can have a, a, a place for your faith to rest upon is because you don't need to go to a library to go back into time to try to reconstruct the original autographs when God has promised you that he would preserve his word for you to be able to have your hands on. Now look, I realize that we still haven't come to the place where we've given you the key that says, here's how you can identify where the word is, right? But I'm telling you, if he promised, if he promised to preserve it, which we haven't proved yet from scripture, but we will, and if he promised to preserve it, that means you can have God's word in your hands. Now there's, um, there's five important reasons for a, before we get into preservation, I want to tell you why there's five reasons, uh, important reasons for a written revelation. A written revelation. First of all, it's to preserve the original revelation. Uh, imagine... You know how I, the, the whole game of telephone, right? I may have mentioned this in one of our first classes that we had on manuscript evidence. And if you had 100 people in a row 
having to pass along a paragraph of information only with what they've received. Nobody has a pen, nobody has a paper, and we line up, we don't even have 100 people here, but we line up around this church this evening, and I start with, I start with a paragraph from a piece of paper, and I read it to one person who has nothing, and then they just have to repeat the oral tradition. And you come all the way around the room. How close is the ending going to be to where I started from in the paragraph that I said? You know? <laughs> Josie's like, probably not, probably not going to happen. It's not. Now imagine writing that paragraph down on a piece of paper at the beginning, reading the paper, and handing that piece of paper to the next person to be able to write it down and pass it to the next person. If I did that with a paragraph and we had the time and we went all the way around the room, how accurate would it be in the end? Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a better question. How accurate would that paragraph be if you believe that paragraph that you believe to be handling was the very word of God itself more important than your life and you wanted to get every jot and tittle correct? I think you're going to be very accurate in the end, don't you? God wants to preserve his word. A written text groups all of the material together. I mentioned to you earlier that I said if, if God gave someone the gift of prophecy in the early church and they were able to speak God's word, they're not speaking Romans chapter 1 all the way through the end of Philemon every week, right? They're, they're speaking a particular part of the revelation from God. But in a written revelation, you could put it all together in a book and you could have the complete revelation. So written is more important than oral. A written text is independent of the speaker and the writer. So Paul was in jail, and yet the people could get the words that Paul, but the, the revelation that Paul had, because Paul was able to write it down, and people were able to take that writing out to different places. So it's independent of the writer. And so it could go, and it could, it could go out and multiply, even if that writer is killed. The written text is more mobile. Someone dies, you don't have to worry about the tradition dying out with your forefathers who were the ones who knew the story, right? The written text can outlive the writer. It makes it very mobile to travel around. And next of all, the last point here. Huh, oh, I, I wrote number four twice just in different ways, so you don't have number five up here on the, on the PowerPoint. But the fifth one is, is that it makes everyone responsible. How many of you, I'm not saying, if you don't own a Bible, that's fine. How many of you own a Bible? How many of you have the opportunity then to be able to read God's Word? Everyone that raised their hand the first time. So therefore, it makes you responsible. A written revelation makes you responsible, whereas if it was only oral tradition, how would you know where to go? And how would you know if you, when you had it all or not, right? It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together and not knowing how many pieces there are, right? If it was only oral tradition, you wouldn't, need, you wouldn't know who do I need to go to to get it, so where can I find it? And B, you wouldn't know when it's completed if it was completed. You don't know what you're lacking. A written revelation tells you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We're thankful for the confidence that we have from it. And we're thankful, Lord, we're in, in, in anticipation of uh, the verses that we'll continue to look at.